Do you can ask us how you want, like, if you want one of us to answer so or we'll one of you just tell us what you want to do. Well. I'm pretty good at following yeah. instructions. So just the first one will go right down the hall. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then maybe the next one I'll ask if you want to jump in when it's over. Okay. And, uh, yeah. What a morning. What a morning. What a morning. Okay. All right. Good morning. We're going to get started. Can you hear me on the mic? No? Good morning. I have no idea. I don't use technology. <laughs> this one is definitely working. Good morning. So I'm Patricia Aceves, and welcome to the Stony Brook Women's Leadership Symposium and our panel presentation on mid-career doctorate, realities and opportunities. And we'll also, we're also going to be talking about choosing between, choosing the right educational path, be choosing between a master's or a doctorate. I get asked this question a lot uh, by women saying, why did you choose to do it? Was it the right thing? Is it going to pay off? Is it too late in my career? You know, what's, what's the right decision? And because I'm regularly asked this, I thought it would be a great topic for the session. So I asked my lovely colleagues here to chime in on the topic, and I'll start with a question and ask each of you, what helped you decide to take the leap and enroll in a doctoral program? Where were you at in your career when you did this? And what was your ultimate goal? Okay. Hi, everybody. This, if this is working, I hope, but I think I speak loud enough uh, for you to hear me. I'm Mariana Savoca. I'm with the Career Center here at Stony Brook. I've been at Stony Brook for 20 years, and um, I decided to take the leap after age 40, and I will tell you why. It was a combination of timing, right? So I was a director for a number of years. I had accomplished a lot of things in my career, and I was thinking about, all right, is this it? <laughs> in a very practical way. Um, additionally to timing, there was probably the most important reason I decided to go back to school is because one of my mentors in my field told me that she thought I could do it. Like in a very simple way, somebody I respected who is or was at the time a tenured faculty member, uh, one of the uh, role models in experiential education. I'll tell you a quick story. Do I have time? So I'm really involved professionally, right? And uh, I was at a conference and this literally happened. I was in the ladies room of the conference hotel and Dr. Mary King, my professional godmother, pulled me aside and said to me, and I quote, Mariana, why haven't you started your doctorate? In the ladies' room. Now, okay, we weren't in the stalls, okay? <laughs> but now we're having this conversation and women are coming in and out of the stalls. And I said, Mary, you know, you're very sweet, but I don't really need a doctorate. Like, I have a great job, I love what I do, all is good. Without telling you the entire play by play, by the end of the conversation, she agreed to let me out of the ladies room <laughs> if I committed to investigating. I didn't commit to doing, I just committed to investigate. And when your mentor tells you to do something, you do it, right? So what I discovered when I started investigating was, well, oh, I could learn something in a program like this. Oh, I could get some value from a program like this. And so literally that's how it started for me. Somebody I know told me they had confidence in my abilities, I committed to investigating, and the timing was right in my life with all my other responsibilities. So my story is a little different. I'm Alfreda James. And when I was in my mid-twenties, I noticed that the 40-somethings, and I think it's interesting that this happened to you when you're 40, the people who are in their 40s who were my, either my associate directors or my directors in admissions were completing PhDs. Mm -hmm. And they did that because they understood that the terminal degree was going to give them leverage and a degree and an amount, certain amount of credibility mm -hmm. 
as they continued for another 20 some years of work. And that's basically, and I said, wow, if they're doing it, then maybe I should consider it as well. Also, completing a PhD was a long held dream. When I was eight years old, my brother finished a PhD in history. And I went, wow, that's what I want to do, you know, because that's what my big brother did. And, uh, and he was an influential person. Mm -hmm. And so I held that dream tightly. But I was, again, I can't remember how old I was when I completed my PhD. It doesn't matter. It was probably over 50. Uh, but um, it was something that I saw as necessary to my advancement. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm Chanel Bradshaw de Hernandez. And you're probably going to hear very similar patterns. I actually have not earned my PhD. I uh, should be defending within the next four to six weeks here <laughs> at uh, Stony Brook <laughs> College of Engineering and the Technology Policy and Innovation um, Program. So, you know, uh, please say prayers. Um, but similar to what Alfreda said, I also had a long dream about um, completing my PhD because I was very passionate about education and economic development. And when I was in seventh grade, um, uh, my family uh, were together, have wonderful parents, and then they split apart. And what happens when you split apart? Uh, one of the economic uh, factors of one of the parents gets really low. And I was with my mom, and we really went from a Cosby lifestyle to a below poverty lifestyle. And it was very tough for my, for my mom. But um, I was recognized when I was in seventh grade to go to a STEP program at SUNY Old Westbury. It was over the summer. And you have to do the research projects. And I really didn't know what it was about. Um, but I did really well in that program. And I had a number of people telling me, you should go all the way. And I said, you know, that's what I want to do. And I had a great opportunity. I went to great schools. I went to Cornell. I went to Columbia. But um, as many of you may know, and especially what, what is great about Stony Brook, is that if you um, have an economic deficit, uh, you can't really get off of the road of working full time when you're supporting your family even before you have children or get married. So having a doctorate was a long-held dream, and I did it one class at a time. And then when my, I started progressing in my career, it started becoming a little bit more difficult to handle. And this is where my story becomes like Mariana. I had someone who I respected very greatly. I had stopped taking classes, and I, I, I think I earned my advancement certificate, professional certificate. And she came to my office, and it was a very wonder. Her name was Dr. Deborah Saldana. And she literally came to my office with an application in my hand, in her hand, and she said, you will not not do this degree. And she said, I want you to apply. I will write your recommendation. And then we'll take it from there, and I'll be your advisor. And that's exactly what happened. And since that time, I got into the program. At, uh, it was at a different school. And I started classes. And then, <laughs> um, and then I discovered I was happily married, and I was pregnant. And my mother said to me, and I'm a little emotional because my mother said to me, I don't care if you're pregnant, I don't care if you have kids, I will help you and you will finish this degree. And today, my mother is in critical care right now at Stony Brook and I told her about this speech and she said, no matter what, you go do this speech and you let everybody know that you had a family behind you and you're going to do this thing. So that's, that's good. I didn't mean to make all of you cry. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. yeah, but this isn't something that you, you need to have support behind you, and you need to know that it's appropriate. Uh, I, when you were talking, I remember uh, Mary Frances Berry, who was a civil rights lawyer. She said that if everybody at the table has two degrees, that means you need to have three. Okay, and that's really, as a woman and as an African-American woman, that is very true. You need to have as much, if not more, in order to be at that table. You won't get invited. I'll add one more thing, Patricia, and that is, and I love these stories of, of long-held dreams that are realized now. I didn't have that dream, guys. Like, I didn't even have a dream to go to college. So if you're sitting here now as a professional and thinking you'd like to pursue another degree now because you just discovered this about yourself now, that's still cool, right? Like. I had none of that, and it's okay. Okay. <laughs> and I'll just <laughs> I'll jump in, and my, my story's a little bit different. Um, I earned my master's 10 years after my bachelor's and my doctorate 10 years after my master's. So it, I 
took me a while, not because I didn't have the desire. After I got my bachelor's degree and I was a, a young mother just starting out in the workforce, I realized that I was working for a, a company in downtown Chicago. I realized this job has no flexibility. You know, I had maybe a week of vacation and sick time. I, my son was sick. I mean, it just, it was really, really difficult. And I thought back to myself, I thought, what can I do in my life that will give me the flexibility I need for my family? So that's what I really, really wanted. That was my end goal. And I thought back to a professor I had in college, and I couldn't even tell you her name. But I remember that she wore Ralph Lauren. She taught in a large lecture hall for political science. She had beautiful clothes. And I remember <laughs> sitting in the, in, the, in the auditorium looking at her and just listening to her and just like, that's who I want to be when I grow up. So I had this picture in my mind of like, I want to be wearing Ralph Lauren, I want to be talking on the stage, and you know, just that, that's the picture I had in my mind. Um, fast forward, when I got my master's degree, um, I called my mother and I told her, you know, mom, I'm graduating with my master's, I want you to come. And her words were, what? You're doing what? I thought that was just a phase. What do you need a master's degree for? She, won, she pushed me to get my bachelor's, but a master's was, you know, that was over the top. And her question to me was, well, isn't the first one enough? And I said, you know, don't worry about it, Mom. I got it covered. Just come to my graduation. I love my mother very much. <laughs> so, um, fast forward to my doctorate. When I enrolled in my doctoral program, um, I called my mother and my sister. And their, their words to me were, why are you being so selfish? Your family needs you. I had three children. And your family needs you. You're just being selfish. I can't believe you're doing this. Why would you do this to your children? And I just said, you know, I'm sorry you don't understand. You know, this is something I feel like I need to do. And fortunately, my husband, who was also in a doctoral program, was very, very supportive. And I couldn't have done it without him. So I, there was some, you know, resistance from my family that was sad because they didn't understand. So. Um, you need to be attuned to the job market. And what is, since I'm, I'm committed to higher ed, and again, when going back to my 20s, that was when I made the commitment to advancing the education of others. And so it became, what is it that I need to do in order to survive in this environment? So yes, the master's degree was essential. And then of course, later on, I understood there would be a PhD. So regardless of what field you're in, look at what's required by the job market to say, do I have enough education? And you know, I graduated from college in 1981. Online learning was in its infancy, maybe even not even that in 1981. Uh, by the time I finished my master's, which would have been about 1980, the first master's degree, that was about 1988, we hadn't even talked, MOOCs, what was that? Nobody understood. Mm -hmm. So you now have more options mm -hmm. for yeah. advanced training. It doesn't, ha we have advanced degrees because that's what was available to us. Now you have more options. A certificate might be the thing that you need, or in some cases, maybe it's an MBA. It doesn't have to be the PhD because you now have more opportunities to learn and get the credentials. It's not just this de degree. And I think that part of the pushback that you got was is taking time from and them not being attuned to the job market. So understand, whatever you're in, take a look at what's required. Um, no, Patricia, do you want to ask your next question? Okay. Um, so uh, when I started the doctorate, of course, I had conversations about what will this do for your job, but I remember when I was younger and going to you know, Cornell, it was never really, it, it wasn't about the job, it was about the discipline. And for me, I'm a fundraiser here. I work here full time in the advancement department and I do corporate and foundation relations. And my PhD thesis is about the impact of those dollars. Like I'm going in front of Bill and Melinda Gates and, and, and the Keck Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm saying this is what, who we are at Stony Brook, and this is what we would like you to invest in, and this is how I think we can partner. And then after we get the money in, they say, how do you know you're successful? And so my thesis is around how do I know that we are being target efficient in the dollars 
that, we, that people are working very hard. I have sleepless nights before pr uh, presentations to go in front of senior industry leaders, executives, and to make your case, in this case now is for Stony Brook. How do I know what I'm saying is true? And the doctorate, even just the pursuit of it, when I say, this is what I'm studying, I'm not just giving you empty words, provides credibility, and it definitely gets me a place at the table. So yes, I mean, I would very much love, you know, that you, know, you get an increase in salary, or you get a promotion, or you get all of those things. In my field, I don't think the doctor is going to really make a difference in fundraising. But I like the flexibility of saying I will be able to teach, and I'll be able to teach about this discipline that I'm very passionate about. I'll, I'll add really quickly and then move on to the next question. Um, so you probably know that I'm not a faculty member. I don't, you know, preach on the stage and, and lecture. When I did get the doctorate, I started looking at the job market. I was a, a staff administrator at another university. I directed uh, some online programs. And I started looking at um, faculty jobs in my discipline. And I realized that the starting salary for a new faculty member was about 20000 less than what I was making. And my husband and I had a long, hard talk about, was that another sacrifice that we could make at that time? Because I had loans I had to pay off. And we decided, because he had finished his doctorate, we had decided that I was happy in my job, I enjoyed it, but going through the, you know, dropping in my salary, um, and then going through the whole tenure process, which I know is very difficult, we decided that that wasn't the right move for me. And, but it has actually worked out very well because now the jobs that I'm applying for, this job here, required a doctorate. So it has definitely paid off. So my next question is, what was the hardest part about being a doctoral student and still wearing all of your other hats? And what sacrifice did you make in order to put your energies towards school? Sleep. Uh, that, 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 that's the biggest, right there, sleep. Uh, and when I started, I finished my math, okay, there are two phases, well, let's divide this in two phases. Uh, I finished my master's in higher ed administration before I had children. I finished the master's in history and the PhD in history after I had children. So that meant that I would have to get up early in the morning to, eat, to do my reading and writing or whatever before they woke up. And in my household, we are, we are early risers because my husband commutes to Manhattan, so it was sleep. Uh, my husband has ridden the 505 or the 605 train for close to 30 years now. So this means that we do not have a social life. We do have a social life, but we just don't have a social life Monday through Friday. Uh, 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 and so and we're very, you know, centered on, we were, and so I w it, it was time management and sleep that suffered. Absolutely. Sleep is the number one thing that suffered. Um, as I said, I was pregnant uh, with my son when I started classes, so um, I was sleep deprived anyway. It was a, I'll have to tell you, and I, and I say this because I want to be honest, it was an extremely difficult time. It was an extremely difficult time. And then when I came to Stony Brook, we moved, the entire family came. I moved four times with my husband for his career, so this was a big move that we took this job because of me. And so I felt and this is difference between, I think, some men and some women, I had a little bit more of a burden on me to make this work um, because, you know, we just moved everyone here for me. Um, and uh, also, I think what suffered was I needed to figure out how to put what's important in my life first. Mm -hmm. And it, it is my marriage. It is my son. It is my family. Um, and I do that for them. And if I'm not doing my doctoral work, my son does not know me without coming into my office, we have pictures, they're very really cute. Every morning I have a library in my house, I sit at my desk, 4.30 in the morning, we get up, I say my prayers, and then I go right to work. And then I, you know, my son comes in with his blanket and his pillow, and he comes underneath my desk and makes a bed, and he takes his last hour of sleep, but we're together. Uh, so, but that sacrifice of why I wish I could cuddle with him, and of course my husband wishes I could cuddle with him, right? Um, but uh, I have to tell you, it was with, with support, but that was the biggest sacrifice. And a little bit of money. I have to tell you, it was a little, a little expensive. You go to conferences, you, go, you do speeches, sometimes you get support, sometimes you don't. So some things that were sacrificed were like vacation time. 
or, or, or uh, family time or budget. Like, well, I have to do the speech in Georgia. Okay, well, we'll take the dollars that we were going to use to go to Florida, and then maybe we'll just delay a vacation. Those were real sacrifices, too. Um, I had to reduce my time for a couple of summers mm -hmm. in order to have the hours in the day. In other words, I reduced my professional obligation to the university in order to have the hours during the day to do the research and writing. And uh, you mentioned your son. You know, mm -hmm. um, my daughter. Uh, she would say she was, she was a little. I'm working on a report, and then she'd go cl slam the door, and I went, "Oh gosh, where'd she get that from?" <laughs> because it was uh, <laughs> uh, 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 little things like that. You know, that can influence your kids' behavior. But they're fine now. They're 27 yeah, and 24. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for holding. <laughs> so I'll just add one thing to this. Y each of you has to decide for yourselves how important whatever degree is you're looking at, mm -hmm. right? And then, as I think Janelle and Alfreda have said, you got to figure out for yourselves what, right, if you're going to spend more time on one thing, what are the things in your life at this moment in time and over the next couple of years that you can flex and wiggle a little bit, right? And so I would never suggest that you should be afraid of the sacrifices because when you want something and you prioritize something and you set a goal for yourself, you have to figure out how to make that, how to put that into your schedule and in your life. Um, so don't, don't be a nervous about a sacrifice because ultimately if it's something you really want, you're willing to sacrifice something for it. And each of you will have something different in your lives that, that will be different. I'm not saying bad, I'm just saying different. And I agree with all of the above. Um, one thing that I gave up was in my job, and that was committees and extra things that I did during the day, my service obligations, because we know that our work spills over, some of us spills over to home life, so I would, you know, after the kids went to bed, I'd log on to email, I'd catch up, and I was on a lot of campus committees and search committees and task forces and things that I really enjoy doing, and my husband said, no, that's it, you have to, you, I want you to get off of every committee that you're on, at least temporarily, because you need to do your work while you're at work so you can do your school when you're at home. And so that was really good advice for me. Next question. Do you, um, do you have a master's degree? I'm going to talk a little bit about choosing between a master's and a doctorate. Um, do you have a master's degree? And if so, at the time, why did you choose a master's over a doctorate? What eventually led you to the doctorate? So I'll start real quick. Um, I earned my master's degree some years after my bachelor's degree, and I had one singular goal to work in career development. And I knew that the degree for entry into the field of career development at that time was a master's degree, and that's why I chose to do that. Um, my advisor at the time, I went to Indiana. I don't know how many of you know that school, Indiana University. Uh, but my advisor at the time is a pretty famous guy in our field. If you, if you know George Koo or have read his stuff, he was my man. Um, he actually suggested that I stay for the doctorate at that time. Guys, I didn't even know why that would have been important. Like, right? All I knew was career counselor, got to get a master's degree. And so I chose not to do that because I chose to follow my goal, which was acquire this degree that would give me access to the job I wanted. No regrets, right? All good, but just it, for, my, for you, I want you to think about what your goals are and why you want another degree, whichever degree that is, right? And that will help you make the right decision as to what and when. You know, again, uh, going back to the person I was between the ages of 21 and 28, um, the master's was essential if I wanted to remain in higher ed, and I did. If I wanted to do anything else in undergraduate missions, I would need to have a master's degree. And uh, my boss at the time probably flat out told me, uh, you know, if I wanted to advance in terms of salary or, ex or, or responsibility, so that was the first push, you know, to the degree. And Rima, in the back of the mind, my back, there was always that desire for the PhD. But again, compelling circumstances. You know, this is what you, this this is the expectation for a professional in this field. So when you start getting those messages, pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I got my master's degree about three and a half years after undergrad. Um, and I think I was very lucky to be in a you know social circle that of, of course you get your master's. It wasn't a, you know, are you or are you not? It was like, are you going to med school? Are you going to law school? Are you gonna get your master's? What are you going to do? And some people went immediately. Some people took a gap. I took a gap. But then um, I always kind of knew I was gonna go for my doctorate. And I was like, I'll just take classes toward it towards it because I couldn't leave the job market. I didn't have that ability to leave the job market. Um, but then after I got the master's, and this was a long time ago, this is how long I've been working on this doctorate. It was like a class here and a class there. Oh, I want to brush up my skills here. And then it wasn't until um, Dr. Saldana came with the application and said, you actually have to apply. Um, and that was, I, I kid you not, eight years later. Now, for my master's, I was working, working full time, and this job inv required travel. So that meant that every fall, I was on the road recruiting students for, let's say, four to six weeks and taking a course. And, and then also doing regular office work in undergraduate admission. And that took a lot of time and effort. So it was one course at a time. I think the one semester that I, I decided to take two classes, it was probably a spring semester when we didn't have the travel burden. And I nearly drove myself crazy. Uh, I don't recommend that. And this was before I had children. This was when I was single. And uh, this was when I, the period when I had what I call the tainted food section of my refrigerator because there was very little food there and that, that something had to, you know, be neglected. And that was, you know, grocery shopping. The, the tainted food section. <laughs> my last question before we open it up to the, to the audience. What has the return on investment been for your career choice? And has it or will it be worth in achieving your, girl, your goals? Well, I haven't quite earned my degree. And I'll tell you, I'm going through some things where I'm thinking I hope that I do, um, just some in internal things. But at the end of the day, I had to make um, uh, a promise to myself. This was to no one else but to myself, that no matter what the circumstances happen as I move forward to try to defend and hopefully to graduate here from Stony Brook, I'm going to stay committed to the message of the research that I've already done which is that we need to be target efficient when we invest in people's lives and they need to have human capacity that's built not just on income, but on their full capacity of what they bring to this earth. And I know that sounds very amorphous and big and, and I hope that I have the, the PhD to back it up, but I, the return on investment was finding myself again and finding that that is my destiny and my true voice. It, you have to have a sense of mission, purpose, not, I mean, the degree is a credential, it's a piece of paper or an electronic badge. You as a person need to have some compelling, again, that commission that you are here for a purpose. You can, with or without the degree. So was it worth it? Yes, but still, it, but it, it has greater value because there's a purpose. Yeah, these are, these are really important ideas to think about. Here's what I'll tell you. When I entered my doctoral program, I did not have a specific career objective. I had a goal. I wanted to learn, and I wanted to become a researcher, scholar, right, because I've done the practitioner route. But I didn't have a job title that I was thinking would be waiting for me when I finished. I was entirely comfortable with that. My classmates in my program who were younger, you know, I want to be a vice president of student affairs, and I'm not into that. Thank God for Rick Ghetto. Um, <laughs> but why I tell you that is this, because I had goals for myself to become more educated, to learn how to do research, to understand more about what intellectual life was about, and I achieved those goals, I'm pretty happy to say. I could not have predicted at that time the, the, what I would receive at the, at afterwards, right? So I completed my doctorate and I got a sabbatical and I spent a semester in Washington, D.C doing research with an organization called the Business Higher Education Forum. And I got connected to a guy with a, a book contract who allowed me to join his project. 
because my dissertation study, like Janelle is talking about, was related to the book he was writing. Like, I am now a published author with a book on Amazon. <laughs> Which is like the coolest thing ever, but when I tell you, I could have never predicted that. And so what I hope for you is that you think for yourself about your goals for whatever degree and for whatever reason, and don't let anybody tell you what to think or, or what you should be doing. Do for yourself, right? And stuff will come for you because, because nobody is gonna live your life like except yourself and you have to be comfortable with the choices the sacrifices the money the investment Cheryl's in school she knows right so yes yes so that's what I mean and as women forgive me and thank you Ken for being in here but girls we have to support each other and so if you're in a position of influence like I am in my office right I head up the department we got to give flexibility we got to give like help to the women around us to do these things. And if you're in a position of somebody who's going to influence other people's lives, you have to give that help. We gotta, we gotta stick together, girls. That's really my message, okay. So I'll jump in and, and make an observation that I have a doctorate in education. I have an EDD. And my colleagues here have PhDs. And I'm often asked, why did you choose the EDD? and not the PhD. And it was because I didn't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. I looked at PhD programs. I lived in a town that the university I worked at did not have PhD programs. They didn't, they didn't have any doctorates. It was a regional comprehensive. And I would have to drive 70 miles to Minneapolis uh, to go to the University of Minnesota to do the doctorate. And when I first started looking at it, they were full-time programs. Online yes, hadn't you know really blossomed yet. It was. 2000, I think. Uh, and there just weren't any online programs that I saw that really kind of spoke to me in the discipline I wanted. So St. Mary's University of Minnesota, a private Catholic institution, offered, had a, like an outreach branch in my town, and were offering evening classes in their EDD. Mm -hmm. And that's what was available to me. I couldn't join a full-time program. There weren't online programs at the time that were in the area I was interested in, and I couldn't drive that far every day. So it just was really a matter of there was this program, there was an EDD right in my backyard. It was convenient, it was a good program, it was rigorous. I did check it out to make sure it was a rigorous program. Uh, I went through the dissertation, I went through the comps, and that was the choice that I had. Am I glad it fits my, di it fits my discipline? I'm an educator, I teach you know, professors how to teach. So that's my field, and so that's the credential that really holds weight in my field. But at an institution like Stony Brook, an EDD really isn't, um, isn't the degree that will get me, I won't ever be a provost at a Stony Brook. That really takes a PhD and, a, and oftentimes a faculty track. But I do know that it's possible to move up to a provost or a president if I wanted to, which I don't right now, uh, at other kinds of schools. So I know that's not that option is not closed for me, but it was it was what it was, and it but it worked out in my benefit. So now I'll open it up to all of you. What questions do you have? How many of you are thinking about? It? Obviously, you're here for a reason. Thinking about a graduate degree of one form or another, or enrolled in one. <laughs> Good. What what programs are you thinking about? Okay, and have you started? Uh, no, I did. I was thinking possibly um, college first. Excellent. So SUNY Buffalo. Yeah. So we all might. Or at least taking a non prescription yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me just tell you real super quick. So I, my PhD is in higher education leadership, which I earned from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. It is called a blended program because I would go to campus twice a year for a week or two to meet my cohort and meet my faculty and take a class in person. And then during the fall and spring, I took classes online, but they were 
night classes which happened to occur on video. So we were, it, it wasn't this Blackboard thing I know that we do here, right? Like it was, we were together via computer at the same time interacting with each other, which I'm a people person, if any of you know me, so I needed the people. And it was a really wonderful way for me to have a cohort, develop relationships with individuals, see them every week at the same time, but still be able to hold my full-time job. So I suspect there may be a, other programs like that in your fields now. At the time, it was the only one. Um, it was the only one. Could you talk a little bit about the difference of a Well, having had looked at both, um, the EDD program that I chose, it was important to me because I also enjoy research and I wanted to be a researcher scholar as well. And so it was really important to me that the program I chose had a strong research component, and it did. I think the differences that I saw in some of the PhD programs, it may have had more work in statistics. So I had one statistics course and I had quantitative methods, qualitative methods, general research methods. So I had, I think, four courses in research. But the PhDs, I think, um, had a little more emphasis on statistics. And also, from, I'm not sure about your, what your dissertations were, but my dissertation was qualitative. And qualitative or action research, you know, with people who are in the field working with practitioners, that was really the thing that, you know, people in an EDD, it's a practitioner's degree. And so a lot of qualitative research, and that was something that I chose to do. Okay, I have a PhD in history, and that is certainly not a quantitative field, but I'm passionate about the subject. If I had wanted to become a faculty member, that's the right thing to do. I personally cannot bear the language of higher education and how it's written. That drives me up the wall. So I really, so again, that's just one of those values things. So, <laughs> so, so for me to have an advanced degree, I, my, my first master's degree is in higher ed administration. And, but my thesis was really more related to the history of women, uh, women's institutions, women's colleges. Uh, and the persistence of uh, female scientists or the, uh, the number of female scientists who came out of women's institutions. So that's more of a history project. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to have a PH, an advanced degree, it had to be a PhD in history. The EDD, I was uh, just the language just doesn't sit well with me. I think it's cold. And uh, that's changed a lot since then, but that was just a personal preference. But I'm glad I did it. I'll just add one more thing real quick and then you can go ahead, I'm sorry. So I took a lot of research classes. My dissertation was quantitative. And let me tell you something, I'm a counselor by background and work and I wanted to eat those statistics for lunch. So don't be afraid, of, like counselors, you know, we're afraid of numbers, that's BS. Don't believe it. And if you really wanna achieve something, you're gonna do it. And that's why you're in school. They, they're supposed to help you, not just talk at you, right? Like really, mm -hmm. you, can, you can totally do this. I'm a 20 year practitioner in a qualitative universe, right? Counseling is qualitative, we know this. I took the classes, I broke my you know what, and it's okay, I did okay, right? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Last question. Sure. So it's, it's a couple, it's multi-layered. So the first thing I heard is, you know, um, you're trying to uh, figure out how you bring the corporate into, you know, maybe a, a, a intellectual discipline, and if you should move forward with your 
PhD among your peer groups of adjuncts. Um, and then what was the second? I, I might have missed a second piece. Uh, just like how long did it take? And how long did it take? And then is there like a split? Right. So the first thing, I, so I was in corporate. Um, and sometimes a PhD is valuable, sometimes it's not, right? So, you know, you kind of, like what we said, you need to know what your, you know, true north is. And no matter what I was going to move forward for mine. Um, so there are many ways that you can incorporate working in industry in a research program. As a matter of fact, I think, to tell you the truth, it's needed. And I think corporations now, more than ever, appreciate having those type of data analytics and what, what, whatever the industry. So we can talk offline about that. But the second thing is, um, honestly, I've been working toward my doctorate, uh, and, my, and my husband will laugh, we've been married for 11 years now, but dating for, you know, four so it's like 16 years. He was like, since the day I met you, you've been saying, I've been, I'm working toward my doctorate. And they've, they've always been in fits and starts. And I would say in the last four years here, has been my deepest dive, but usually before then I would take a semester off or I'll take, you know, I'll take a class. I was in a, another program and I went from an EDD to a PhD, um, which I thought was really helpful. And it was by chance, by the way, I just want to get back to this young lady's um, state. It was by chance because my topic is exactly the same. My t this, uh, so the, qual the paper I wrote in my last um, uh, school was a very similar subject to what I'm doing now, just a little bit of a deeper dive. And then I thought it was an added benefit that it was a PhD, so I did have to go deeper and it is quantitative. But going back to you, I absolutely have a support network. I have a support network of people that are my friends who've also done it. So social capital, I think, is really important. If you're around people who've done this, it becomes like, all right, so, you know, what's the next step? If you're around people, I'm thinking about um, Dr. Savitz's story, that, you know, might say, well, why are you doing this? I think sometimes it gets a little harder. So find your tribe, right? And then I have an immediate cohort of amazing students right here at Stony Brook who are doing it too. And, and we do a research class every um, week. Um, I'm going through a little something with my program right now, and they've come to my house. They've had coffee and tea, and how are you doing? Okay, let's just keep, stay focused on the, and they have been amazing. So you, you'll find your tribe. All right, that's all we've got. Um, the recording will be available uh, for all of the sessions afterwards. And please, if you have more questions, you, you know where we live. Uh, sit at our table at lunch or grab us at the networking reception afterwards. Thank you.